So welcome everyone. Uh, our so second speaker is going to be Ahmed, who is going to talk about da data processing and machine learning. So over to you. Hey. Hi, welcome everyone. So this will be a sort of a high level presentation. Uh, so I'm going to present myself first. I'm, uh, so, uh, uh, I'm Ahmed. I'm studying at uh, KTH, uh, currently doing a machine learning master. And um, so I've been interested in Python for some years now. And uh, I'm, I was really happy when I actually learned that Python is sort of the tool that everyone uses now in machine learning, which is kind of convenient for me. And so you can find me on Twitter and GitHub on that uh, username. And uh, by the way, I was a bit surprised by the presentations that we just saw. Uh, for those that were in the Pandas presentation, that's like uh, well done if you followed those presentations because that was some really good stuff. I tried to talk about that, but that was a sort of a high level point of view compared to this. And also Ian's presentation, which sort of discussed what uh, data science was about. And that's what I'm going to start with a bit, but more in a sort of trollish way. So data science. Uh, so you've probably heard some of these buzzwords, uh, big data, uh, <laughs> no SQL, no JS, and you see everyone is hopping on uh, uh, on the boat and just following the trend. So it might seem like data science is also that sort of trend, uh, which is actually true in many cases. Like you, you're probably going to find companies that just need uh, to maybe calculate some mean and uh, maybe, okay, do some normalization and maybe, okay, okay, they're going to do maybe a linear regression and they're going to try to like talk about data science and um, maybe build a data science team when it's not needed. But for mo most of the time, it's actually valuable because companies have a lot of data and they are not using it right. What data science is, uh, like Ian said previously, is basically statistics and computer science. Um, so you're not supposed to know everything about statistics. I know I don't, uh, <laughs> uh, but you're supposed to have sort of uh, a feat in each word. Uh, so know the basics of statistics and also know the engineering challenges that are be behind that, uh, data processing. So what a typical data analysis pipeline looks like is this. So this is an example from um, a paper about uh, a biomedical named entity recognition. So what you see, the core prize, what you would have as an input, that could be an image, that could be a text document usually go through a pre-processing phase where you're going to like treat that data, then feature extraction or feature processing. That's the step where you're going to extract the relevant data that you feed to your statistical models. That's not like if you're having an image, your models don't understand what an image is. You're going to usually convert that to vectors. But we're going to talk about that later. Then you're going to feed it to some model, statistical model. And finally, you're going to get some result that you often pr post-process. So don't worry, we're going to talk about all this. Uh, again, this is sort of a high-level uh, presentation, but I'm going to try to show some code from time to time. But anyway, I mean, there, there isn't that much code to write to use these tools, actually. All right, so first we're going to like just quickly say, OK, why Python in the first place? Why not like present this at some Java conference or something? And then how to fetch your data? Because if you want to do machine learning, you probably need to have some data to do it on how to analyze the data you get, and actually I'm not going to talk about simple CV a bit, and how to visualize and explore the data really quickly if we have time. Okay, so first, why Python? Uh, well, I'm probably sure I don't need to convince you guys if you're here in PyCon Sweden, but I'm still going to go for it. So uh, PyCon, uh, Python is actually really useful uh, because uh, often in data science you're going to be working with people that are not uh, used to do hardcore programming, uh, with uh, C or whatever, and uh, so it's really easy to pick up, and it's also easy to understand and read, uh, maintainable, and also easy to write when you're prototyping, and that's something that happens a lot when you're uh, dealing with data. Uh, so uh, Python also has some strong principles like simplicity that you find in uh, libraries uh, that you use, like Scikit, and uh, especially the point that I focus on is there's an incredible uh, community when it comes to data science in Python. There are some really, really great libraries that are really easy to use and constantly maintained, like Pandas, like Scikit-Learn, SimpleCV, and we're going to see some of these. And there's also some features in the language itself that are really helpful, like list comprehensions. You do a lot of those when you're dealing with data. 
uh, some operators uh, like sorting lists, uh, applying functions with map, or like doing some weird tests with any and that sort of stuff. And there's also the fact that uh, functions are first class citizens in Python, like you can pass them over and that's also pretty useful. Okay, so we're gonna start with seeing how you can actually fetch the data you're looking for. Uh, so usually uh, th there's this needle in a haystack problem with data is that uh, you, you're looking for a, a, a little amount of data in a really big space. Like for instance, you're, you're gonna download uh, uh, 500 kilobytes uh, of HTML, but you're actually just looking for a couple of words in that page. And so you have to use some tools to do that. So we're gonna see s quickly see some tools to uh, fetch data. So the first one we're gonna see is requests, uh, uh, which is a library that sort of wraps around your lib2 and some other uh, Python built-ins to uh, let you do HTTP requests really easily without having a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, by the way, Kenneth Rates, I don't know if he's here, but uh, he's, he's the one who created requests and he's gonna give a talk on APIs. And uh, that should be interesting because request is well known for its really Pythonic and simple API. Uh, so, like fetching a web page is really easy with a request. You just do request.get, you write the URL, and you can get the text. This is not really useful because usually what you want from a web page is the actual content of some tag. You don't want to parse the text with regular expressions. Please don't do that. Uh, so, what you can do, though, is you can communicate with uh, REST APIs, for instance, and we have a lot of those. Like, if you're fetching Twitter likes, or if you're fetching, I don't know, some data from some enterprise API, you can request these really quickly. You don't have to encode the parameters yourself in the URL. Everything is done by requests. Um, now, if you want to parse an HTML page, what you're going to need is a parser. LXML, which is usually used with XML, also has an HTML module and lets you ju do just that. You just write the URL. Like, for instance, this is a search on Blockhead. And please don't do this because this is probably illegal, I guess, uh, like fetching their data. But uh, you can quickly fetch stuff based on their CSS classes and you can do XPath requests uh, if you want to fetch really specific stuff. Um, but what happens if you want to fetch a lot of data? Uh, like, for instance, some random e-commerce website that w I'm not going to name and you want to fetch like all their items. Well, then you have some tools like uh, Scrapby, I think it's pronounced, uh, that lets you build a web crawler. So this is the code for a web crawler in Scrapby. It's, like, it's really easy. You just define the starting page, uh, what you do on each page, and the type of items that you want to save from that page. And it's going to do everything by itself. It's going to go from URL to URL. It's going to avoid loops. It's going to do that sort of stuff. So really cool stuff. Check it out. Then there's Pandas. And uh, maybe it's an insult to call it excellent steroids because it's so much more than that. But that's basically what most people use it for. Uh, it's inspired by R's data frame. And for those that were in the presentation, you probably saw it. And it's pretty fun. For those that weren't there, I mean, check it out. and. The, so the I just learned that the presenta presentations are recorded, so probably check the presentations when they're posted. Really cool stuff. So you can do this, this sort of stuff, like read the CSV, fill missing values, and interpolate other things. Okay, so now let's talk about the actual machine learning part. So part one is pre-processing. Uh, so usually when you get your data, it's n never in the way that you're actually going to need it. Uh, so statistical models don't know anything about Twitter likes or images or even text, actually. Most of them uh, only deal with vectors and numbers, distributions of numbers. So what you're going to need to do is uh, extract the features from that data that you have. And uh, what you're going to do after that is usually you have some sort of pre-processing, like scaling of the your vectors. and Sometimes you also do feature selection, dimensionality reduction. So we're going to try to see this really quickly. So feature extraction. So as I said, you have like images, text, or structured data, like uh, database tables, and you want to turn them into uh, feature vectors that your models are going to understand. So this is a really simple example. Imagine you have uh, a corpus with some uh, documents. And so here the documents are only sentences that uh, are really useless, but 
imagine that this is instead of a sentence, you have like a huge text. Uh, so how to actually use this with machine learning? What you're going to do is you're going to try to turn this into vectors. Uh, and one way to do this is TFIDF, uh, which stands for term frequency and inverse document frequency. And that basically will give tell you, oh, in this document, this word is present a lot. And in this document, this word is present, but it's not important anyway. It takes into consideration the fact that a word is present in all documents, for instance. So it's not relevant anyway, like like R or I or something. Those words are not really relevant. So you, d you don't want to give a big weight to those. And so with scikit-learn, it's insultingly easy. I mean, it's like one line. You just uh, use feature extraction dot text dot tfidf vectorizer to instantiate your class. And then, yeah, the line is right there. Uh, fit transform will take this and transform it into vectors. And that's it. You don't need to do anything. And uh, like having coded the tfidf calculation myself, it's usually way more than this. So thanks, scikit-learn. Uh, another thing is vectorization. So imagine, okay, we have a dictionary and it contains values like uh, for every data point. Imagine we have countries or, uh, you know, actually I have uh, an example after this. So we have like really various uh, variables and we want to turn this into a vector. So yeah, here's an example. We imagine we have students or like people and uh, we have three variables. Weight, which is a numerical variable. Sex, which is a categorical variable, which means it can take different values, a discrete number of values and student, which is a Boolean value. So we can, uh, using the vector, uh, the, the dict vectorizer, it's gonna basically turn this into vectors. Uh, it, like imagine a vector where each uh, component is an information about this. Like the first one will be the weight. So it will just be the number, like 60 for the first one. Uh, then you're gonna have two uh, columns. One that will be sex equal male. And that will be one if the sex is male and it will be zero otherwise, and one will be sex equal female, that will be one if sex is female, etc. And then for the Boolean one, the Boolean one will only be converted to zero and one, two. So again, uh, ultimately, you, you, I mean, most models need you to convert whatever data you have into this vector representation. And even if, so once you have vectors, it looks something like this. So your data will look something like the, this vector. But sometimes what you have is uh, data that is really different. Like imagine we have weight and then we have age. Uh, these are not the same. They don't have the same mean. They don't have the same deviation. And some models are really sensitive to deviation. Like for instance, they only activate around zero. So wha what you're often gonna do if you wanna maximize your performance uh, is normalize this data, which is uh, most of the time just bring the mean to zero and the variance to one. So again, this is really easy with scikit-learn, one line of code, and it will normalize your data. Then there's dimensionality. So I imagine you're processing images. So imagine you want to consider your images as a huge vector where each value is uh, the RGB value uh, of that, uh, that uh, pixel. That's big. Like if you have a 1,000 times 1,000 pixels, that's a lot of data. And probably you don't want to deal with all that data. Uh, another example would be music recommendation. Imagine your vector is, do I like this muse, this song or not? And it so happens that some songs are actually not liked by anyone because they stink. So what you, you want to do is you want to just ignore those. Uh, th those are probably not Taylor Swift uh, songs. Those you want to keep because a lot of people listen to those. And there are a lot of algorithms, algorithms that will take care of that for you. So an example is PCA, sorry, I mean, oh, I talk about PCA here. PCA is principal component analysis. And basically what I will do, imagine that each data point you have is in space. Imagine, but I mean, it's hard to imagine, but it's like 1000 dimensions space, not. And it, we're gonna take that point and project it into a space with less dimensions. An easier example would be like three dimensions. Imagine like uh, an object in three dimension, you, you take the projection on two dimensions on a, with an angle sort of, as so, uh, so as you can keep the maximum variance, like you don't lose a lot of information. Because what we want to do is uh, reduce the dimensions while still keeping as many much information as we can. So PCA is usually for linear data. If you have something nonlinear like this, like those circles, you might want to use kernel PCA, which is PCA plus it uses a custom kernel, which is adapted to the type of data you have. And that that's also on Scikit. Okay, so now the let the fun begin, like the actual funny part. Uh, so we have our data, it's 
processed correctly, it's normalized, all that. So we're going to actually be able to feed that to some models. So there are two main problems uh, when it comes to machine learning usually. It's classification and regression. So that we're going to see the first one. Classification is basically you're going to say if something, like you're going to put items in boxes. Uh, like imagine with images, which is always the easiest example. You have images and you want to say, oh, is this a BMW car? Is it a Volvo car? Or is it like another brand? And um, so there are many methods to do this. Uh, so I like there's decision trees, uh, naive Bayes classifier, uh, support vector machines, which are really really um, popular. K nearest neighbors, not not that much. And then there's uh, all uh, the neural network stuff, which I think there's a talk about neural networks afterwards. So maybe you want to check that out if you're interested. So yeah, th so these are a lot of like barbaric words. So. I thought maybe we should take a typical Swedish example to see what classification is like. So yeah, imagine this problem. So you have a lot of Swedish pastries and you want to classify them. So basically what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to get as many examples of that data. Like here I'm trying to classify, basically make my computer understand what a canal boule is. So I'm going to take like a lot of canal boule, like one canal boule isolated, uh, one on top of the other, then one with like some paper around it. So this is really important when you're uh, building training data. Try to have diversified training data. Like don't overtrain on the same type of things. And I'm gonna feed it to my model. And then what you also need to do is like basically give it like the something to contradict to train against. If you only give it kind of bullet, it can't tell what's not a kind of bullet. So you're gonna give it like other pastries because they sort of look like it and also like something that doesn't look like it at all like that BMW or whatever oh that's a Volvo uh, convenient uh, so and after this once we've done this we can actually give it input data and try to guess if it's a camel or not and that's really awesome so uh, keep in mind that here our model doesn't see images uh, what you will feed your images uh, model is feature vectors and the way you extract those really vary depending on what you want to actually do and so yeah here in example the model gives as an output yes or no like oh this is a cannibal this is not a cannibal this is not a cannibal so done so uh, and this is the code again really really simple code just a couple lines of code you uh, instantiate a svc which is a support vector machine uh, I, I forgot what SVC actually stands for, but uh, anyway, it's in the it's, it's support vector machine module with a NARBF kernel. So kernels depend on the type of data you're dealing with. Some will be more uh, performant than others, but then there's uh, scikit-learn actually gives you tools to automatically choose the right kernel. It will try all of them and give you the best one, basically. And then you're doing predictions. Um, so then there's regression. So uh, regression is basically another type of problem. Uh, imagine you're getting a lot of inputs and the output for those inputs. And your problem is, I want to guess the output for an input that I got. And I don't have the output. And this can also, I'm sorry, this can also like be sort of predicting the future. Uh, like, for instance, uh, you're going to have, uh, as a function of multiple parameters, uh, like... Uh, uh, I don't know, like weather, uh, price of uh, Swedish pastries, of coffee, and then the output is the hap happiness of sweets, the average happiness of sweets. And you're going to try like to find your, uh, fit a model to the, the, that sort of data that you have. That way uh, you can predict how uh, sweets are going to be if we, for instance, make coffee more expensive, which is like not really happy. Um, so this is an example. This is uh, just a s normal linear regression. Imagine, so I have this uh, f function, which uh, just returns the value that I give it as an input with some randomness. This is like the worst type of example for linear regression, but still. So this is a linear function with some noise that's modeled with randomness. So imagine w this is our input. And we want to predict what this function is. We don't know what f is. We only have the a lot of x's and a lot of y's for this function. So you just feed that into your model, uh, like that part where I do fit. And afterwards, you can use that CLF object uh, with a prediction function. You give it as an input a series of inputs, and it will give you a series of outputs, uh, which are like the most likely outputs. 
So if we have some time at the end, I will show you some demos, like the code that I showed on the slides. I will try to run it. And basically here, the example, uh, we would get this. Uh, the green points are, uh, as I said, it's the training data. And the blue line is basically the predicted, um, the predicted outputs for some inputs that we tried. So it, it seems pretty good actually, because here we have a lot of noise and we try to f choose basically the line that fits that with the least amount of um, uh, error. So th then there's another problem which can be put in classification, but I mean sort of, it's clustering and it's basically grouping similar data points together. Uh, sometimes you know that for instance, uh, you have customers and you have a lot of data about customers. It can be anything. It can be like, did they buy this or not? Or it can be age or whatever. And you want to basically give, let's say you want to segment your customer base into multiple groups to give them better ads. Like you, you don't want to put the same ads for everyone. You want to maybe build four ad campaigns that are tailored for your customer groups. So then you're going to, that, that's a clustering problem. You want to see what are the clusters you have. It can be with a known number of uh, clusters, or it can be with uh, an unknown number. And here, here's a sort of a comparison of uh, many clustering techniques. Uh, so uh, the most popular one, I think, is k-means, and it's also one of the fastest ones, but then it doesn't always give the best value. Um, so you can see in mini batch k-means, and so yeah, basically, as you can see here, it, there's there's no like one way to do things. It really depends on the sort of data you're dealing with. Obviously, there are some ways of like w uh, some models that are not used anymore because they they were just proved inferior. But most of the time, it will be uh, okay. So I have this sort of data, and this model works best. So yeah, th this is actually built with Scikit. This graph. There's a little utility function that lets you do this. Basically, you give it data, uh, input and output, and it will try all models and show you the, the, the result. That way you can choose which one works best because this is really subjective. Like it's hard to have an objective way to say, oh, this works uh, right or this doesn't work right. DBSCAN is another one, uh, which I think is unsupervised. You don't give it the, like you don't give it the number of clusters you're expecting. It will tell you, oh, there are six, six clusters in this data set. Uh, okay. Then there's model evaluation. So, I mean, what I'm saying here is sort of not true because that's actually what we just did. We just looked at a graph and we're like, oh, k-means actually looks sort of right, which is actually okay. You can do that from time to time if you have, like, for instance, if you're just prototyping. But then you, uh, when you, you have, like, imagine you have a web app that does recommendation at scale and you don't want to leave that to randomness. You don't want to, like put your web app and be like, oh, recommendations are looking good these weeks, so we're going to keep it. You want to really have metrics that will tell you we're doing a great job or not. Scikit-learn gives you some of these things. First, all the model uh, objects have a scoring function that will let you know uh, the, the precision of predictions. Like, did they predict uh, the um, expected outputs correctly or not? And uh, keep in mind, you're not supposed to do t these, uh, this testing on the same input you're having for training, because that can create problems. Y what you want to do is you want to split uh, your inputs into one part for training and one part for testing. But again, uh, scikit-learn actually does that by itself. You don't need to uh, split them yourself. Scikit-learn will take that care of that. So this is an example, uh, again, with an SVM. You just use that uh, model you have. You pass it to the cross-validation.crossval score uh, function. And you pass x and y, which are inputs and expected outputs. And you can tell it, OK, show me the precision on this, or show me this mean squared error. And these are really important when you have uh, systems that are actually deployed, and especially if it, uh, they're like really important and have um, big business weight. OK, so that's more or less everything I wanted to show in Scikit. Quickly going to see some uh, ways to visualize and explore data. So the main library is matplotlib. It's used everywhere. It's used uh, uh, in pandas and everything. Uh, it can be ugly, so you know you, it's hard to customize, but it's, it gets the job done. There's Bokeh for interactive presentations uh, that you can export on the web. And 
Then there's ggplot, which is sort of like Bokeh, but inspired by R. And finally, there's IPython. And there's a lot to say about IPython, but unfortunately we don't have the time, but check it out. You can create cool notebooks and share them and put them on the web and other things. We won't have time to do a demo, unfortunately. And I think that's all. Thank you. Sorry, I really had to be really quick at the end. Didn't have t too much time left. Yeah, hello. Um, about the about the score, uh, is there? Um, I know that there, there's more scoring functions than than the cross valid validation. Uh, do you know uh, any type of uh, similar uh, scoring functions? Um, so the ones I showed are precision and mean squared error. And then there's F1, and uh, uh, I think. Well, well I meant more. Oh, uh, uh, oh you mean the actual function? The other actual than cross validation. Python function. Okay, sure, sure. There are a lot of. Uh, f yeah, sure. Uh, there's. Yeah, I, I don't remember the names though, but there's a whole module. The so I was using the cross validation sub module in Scikit, and there are a lot of functions there. If you go to the documentation, maybe we'll find uh, better help. But yeah, sure. There's a lot more than that. Obviously, I couldn't present everything, but... Uh, I just want to ask a question about uh, the kernels. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, w the first part of the question is uh, in the code. Um, is it um, How hard is it to implement your own custom kernel? Oh, it's really easy. I think uh, you okay. just uh, pass a callable that takes uh, as an input uh, um, like a function. Uh, I mean, yeah, a couple that takes as an input some data point and what would the kernel uh, return? And yeah, okay. that's as easy as it is. I, I think it's actually the same parameter. If you pass a string, it, it search it searches for a kernel. If you pass a callable, it will use it. And, and uh, my, my second question is probably a bit more abstract. In your, um, in your example, you showed that um, I think it was the, the RBF kernel uh -huh. had the best uh, regression. Uh, I think uh, so. Um, in general, when you're like looking at data, how is there a systematic way that you go about choosing, say, what the right parameters in your regression yeah, or your I, I think there's a, a grid search. Uh, Scikit lets you do a grid search uh, to find the best kernel. Uh, and okay. it, for all parameters, actually, for like e even like for some models have meta parameters, like number of something and etc. And Scikit-Learn lets you like search until you find the right parameters. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, uh, question about uh, scoring. You said that uh, for... It's on. It's on? Oh, oh okay. I have just to... <laughs> <laughs> Levinsky style. Um, <laughs> so um, you said that uh, you have to be careful n to score the n your classifier by passing data, which is not the same you used to train the system. So how do you know that the score you get back evaluates the algorithm and not the quality of the training data then? Well, uh, you want to evaluate the actual algorithm. Uh, if you have bad quality data, uh, I mean, wha wi what's bad quality data? Like, you mean not enough data points? I don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not yeah, into so this uh, yet. Uh, but okay, uh, let's so maybe the question can be reformulated. How do you select uh, good training de de data and is this data specific to the kind of algorithm I you think will if you have bad inputs it's really hard to choose uh, the best model so you want to make sure you have good inputs first like uh, it's normalized and things like that uh, because it can bias like imagine you have like non-scaled vectors maybe one model will sort of works with that like it will sort of work uh, so it will perform better than another one but if you actually scale them like there it would be a totally different one that actually works better. So yeah, really make sure your data is in the correct shape uh, before you feed it to the models, bef before it, uh, you start doing cross-validation. That's sort of like the last step. Thank you. Uh, 
Do you hear me? Yep. Yes, it's on. Okay. Uh, in your example with the f uh, cinnamon buns, uh, if you were to implement that for real, what kind of features would you extract before feeding them to the classifier? Uh, I'm really terrible with images. I never worked with images, but I think uh, there are. So I, I didn't talk about some libraries. There's a library called Scikit Image, which lets you uh, uh, extract features from images, features that are known to be invariant to rotation and colors and size and that sort of stuff. So I think I would use Scikit Image to extract features. I wouldn't build the, build them myself, and then I would feed them to like an, uh, SVM maybe. But I, uh, again, I'm terrible at this, so don't take my advice. Ah, I guess that is there. Any kind of interesting benchmarks that you have compared to doing this with something else? So uh, any kind of interesting benchmarks compared to something else? Like performance benchmarks, you mean? Uh, so I I know. I, I actually didn't try that many li modules, but, but uh, you can probably find something online. But I think Scikit is sort of like the standard now, so it must be fast. OK. Oh, okay. I think that's uh, yeah, that's all. That's it. Okay. Thanks. So thank you a lot, Ahmed. Thank you.